Our second speaker will be Professor Robin Wood, director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center in South Africa. His talk is entitled, Out of Thin Air, Capturing and Visualization of TB Aerosols. His talk bridges the source and transport and dispersion components of the pathway. Good afternoon from uh, Cape Town. Um, I'd like to thank the, uh, the uh, organizers, life sciences across the globe for this opportunity to uh, present this afternoon. And my focus is going to be on the isolation of MTB organisms from bioaerosols. This is um, not a new topic. Uh, here's um, a published study from uh, just over 100 years ago from Chausset, um, who was intrigued with uh, investigating the infectiousness of bioaerosols from his patients. And he developed um, this desktop uh, cough box in which there were guinea pigs. And he, um, he was able to show that about 38% uh, of his patients were able to infect guinea pigs. He also interestingly noted that the air flows within the box changed the results quite considerably. So um, uh, it was one of the first observations of that. Now here I've just put on uh, what I consider the, uh, the big changes in um, sensitivity of isolation of organisms over the last hundred years or so. And you can see that for the first decades of the 20th century, they were still debating whether uh, TB was an airborne disease. And that was really um, nailed very well by Wells and Riley in the late 1950s, when they showed that you could take air from a TB ward, um, get it to go through ducting to a colony of guinea pigs, and then remotely infect the guinea pigs. So this showed that airborne um, uh, transmission of TB um, could go over distances um, and uh, uh, really stop the discussions on um, the origin of infections. Um, little happened over that hundred years uh, until about 2012, uh, Kevin Fennelly um, re-examined the cough box uh, of Chausset, but instead of using guinea pigs, he used uh, colony forming units on solid media in Anderson impactors. So his patients coughed into uh, this box and he found about 28% of his smear positive cases could transmit infections to guinea pigs. Things changed dramatically um, with the work of uh, Carolyn Williams um, and she was using a mask technology in order to capture um, uh, TB uh, DNA. And uh, this allowed the timing of um, uh, the collection to be much longer. Um, they were using hours as opposed to seconds or minutes. Uh, and they, um, they managed to get the sensitivity up to about 65%. Uh, in our group, uh, Patterson, uh, ben, Benjamin, managed to get up to 77% by combining DNA and colony forming units on an Anderson. And then um, the Williams group have uh, improved their sensitivity yet again. And probably because people are now willing to wear masks for longer, uh, they were wearing masks up to 24 hours and got up to uh, about 86% of their smear positive cases having airborne um, evidence of airborne mycobacterium. And then more recently, and that's what I'm going to show you here, we've increased the sensitivity further um, to about uh, 93%. So this is the technology that we use, and I could see some parallels with what Lydia was talking about. This is a personalized clean room. Um, it has um, um, HEPA filtration at a very high um, uh, rate of um, up to one cubic meter per second, and we collect uh, samples. And essentially on this cartoon, you can see uh, that the air flows are collected. Uh, we found that in order to uh, uh, capture explosive events such as coughs, that we needed to have very high flow rates. Uh, so we have a flow rate of about 300 liters per minute. Um, that flow is then directed to um, carbon dioxide monitor to give us an idea of volumes, particle sound, uh, size and quantification. 
Um, we collect the, um, the output in a liquid cyclone. So if we investigate the liquid collected with mass spectrometry, uh, we can get um, non-volatile organic compound analysis. And um, lastly, we can use the um, particles within the uh, liquid cyclone to identify, quantify, and uh, investigate the MTB organisms themselves. So just to show you um, briefly um, what sort of outputs we get. So on the left-hand side is a series of 10 coughs, and you can see in blue the carbon dioxide uh, concentrations uh, as we measure them. Um, and then in the lower panel, you can see the particle sizes, again on a log scale, which is very important, uh, from the green, which are relatively large particles, to the black, which are, um, in our case, uh, half to one um, micrometer. You can see that coincident with the um, carbon dioxide peaks, we can measure um, the size and numbers of particles. Um, that data was published um, a couple of years ago. Uh, on the um, right-hand panel, uh, which is something a little bit hotter off the press, it's just been reported in scientific reports, and this is the work of Darpeng Chen, um, and he showed here a panel of uh, metabolites and lipids which were increased in um, uh, patients, in uh, well patients that didn't have TB, and in the lower panels in orange in patients with TB. And by combining the, these data together, you can get um, quite high uh, predictive values, rock curves of, uh, with the areas under the curve about 95%. Now I'm going to talk about what we actually, uh, what this topic of this talk is going to be, and that is the microscopic detection of TB. And this is based on this paper that was published um, uh, from the Stanford group uh, again uh, four years ago. And uh, what they uh, developed was a trailose sugar um, probe, which was taken up by um, organisms and processed by something called the antigen 85 complex and mycolated. Uh, trailos, which is then incorporated into the growing uh, TB um, or other organism membrane. Um, it seems as though antigen 85 is, has some specificity to the actinobacteria, um, and um, that's a fairly broad grouping of organisms, but um, I think it's, uh, it, it's positive, it's present in mycobacteria and also in non-TB uh, mycobacteria, Carini bacteria, um, uh, also in Nocardia, which is relatively rare. Uh, the organism causes Whipple's disease, which is uh, not really related to respiratory problems and uh, propionic bacteria, which are basically skin. So the, um, the concern would be, have we got any contamination from other mycobacteria and Carini bacteria? Uh, we take the, um, um, the sediment um, and we uh, spread it over uh, these nano wells uh, in order to give us um, optical fields um, uh, that are easily screened and also to increase our signal to noise ratio um, uh, so that we can identify small numbers of organisms. Um, we use fluorescent microscopy. And this is the sort of output that we get. So on the left-hand panel, you can see uh, the green fluorescence, which is concentrated in the uh, polar areas of the organism, uh, which are growing. On the right-hand side, top panel, you can see that we can explore for each individual uh, the fluorescence intensity along the length of the organism. And in most of the organisms, the, uh, the growth zones are at the poles, but you can see there's a few where the, uh, um, the fluorescence is increased in the mid, uh, mid sections, and we believe those are organisms that are uh, in the process of um, dividing. Uh, you can see that we have the ability to measure the length of these organisms, the width of these organisms, and the shape, and make correlations with um, uh, laboratory-grown stains. If we look at the type of organisms uh, or the shape of the organism, the phenotypes of the organisms that we're identifying, you can see that they're pleomorphic. There's uh, a lot of different shapes. And we are working on um, pattern recognition software in order to identify and to classify these, um, uh, these organisms. 
And um, the problem with any test that has very high specificity, uh, we can identify down to a single organism, uh, you need to uh, address uh, specificity. So as I've mentioned, antigen 85 uh, limits uh, to the phylum actinobacteria. Uh, we have taken second specimens at each uh, sampling of our patients and stain and um, process them for digital droplet um, RD9 PCR. Uh, the significance of that is that that distinguishes mycobacterium tuberculosis from other mycobacteria. And we can also stain these parallel samples with oramine. And um, the two panels beneath show the relationship between DDPCR and oramine and our bacterial counts are significant. But an interesting, interesting observation, zeal nielsen stains were negative for this grouping. Uh, our microscopists are blinded to the sample source. We take a, um, a uh, sample from the booths in exactly the same way as the patient sampling, and 100% of those samples uh, have, uh, uh, have revealed negative tests. And more excitingly, and this is um, very recent data, uh, this is work uh, done by Anast Anastasia Koch in our group. Uh, she's looking at how to deal with these very small biosample uh, mass. And um, preliminary data shows that with multiple displacement DNA amplification, we can find uh, mycobacterial tuberculosis um, uh, DNA. And to date, we've not found any Carini bacteria DNA. Uh, the problem is that we can't get enough biomass at the moment uh, to get whole genome sequencing because the coverage uh, is not um, high enough. So can, how can we use this sensitive detection of airborne uh, organisms to give insights into important TB questions? So uh, the first one was, uh, which has sort of been touched on, is to look at cough versus other respiratory activities for TB production. And this is uh, a manuscript which uh, is in press. I think it's, um, it's online now with the American Journal. Um, uh, so it's, it's going to be in print in the next few days. And uh, just to briefly show this work from uh, uh, Ryan uh, Dinkele, who is a PhD student uh, in the IDM. And uh, what you see here is um, an APS uh, sampling um, particle counter. And you can see the boxes into which the particles are, um, uh, are attributed. And um, in the lower panel, you can see, again, on the log scale, uh, the particle uh, size distribution um, um, for deep breathing, uh, the, the force vital capacity, which is meant to reproduce uh, Lydia's uh, bronchial burst uh, in the peripheral lungs, tidal breathing, and coughing. And sure enough, coughing does produce more particles than uh, tidal breathing. But if we move on to look at the number of organisms, and we believe that these organisms are probably pr principally derived from the peripheral lung, you can see that uh, the counts are very similar across the three maneuvers, slightly higher in the tidal breathing group. And in the um, lower panel at the left, you see uh, the problem with dealing very small numbers that each of these uh, processes take place for about five minutes. Part of the reason for that is it's very unpleasant to cough for longer than five minutes. Uh, but if we take five minutes of uh, forced vital capacity, tidal breathing, or cough, we get about 70% positivity. But if you add them together combined, that's where we get the 93%. So the combined pooled is really a sample of 15 minutes, whereas the other ones are individual samples of uh, five minutes. So uh, Ryan goes on to discuss <clears throat> the probable um, contribution during a 24-hour period to infectiousness and uh, encourage you to, uh, to read that if, if you can get your hands on the paper. Uh, what I now want to do is to move to a topic which has uh, really driven my interest in this field. And this is a paper um, uh, written by uh, Sabine uh, Hermans uh, a few years ago. And we looked back at uh, the last 100 years of tuberculosis uh, in three cities, in London, New York, and in Cape Town. So on the left-hand uh, panel, you can see the population TB mortality, and there's good figures for all these um, uh, cities, and that's why I chose them. You can see that in the early 1900s, TB mortality was uh, very much higher in Cape Town than the others. Treatment came in in the 1950s, and you can see there was a, a massive decrease, which is really only came up again in the uh, late uh, 
1990s um, uh, associated with the HIV epidemic. So if you dissect that out to see why did the mortality uh, po population mortality go down, you can see that uh, the case fatality was what drove it. And the case fatality and the use of treatment was equally effective in both three cities. But what you notice in the, in the um, um, right-hand panel is that uh, TB incidence rate or TB notification rate as a measure of that didn't decrease and is still much higher than it was 100 years ago. And the latest survey in South Africa showed um, an instance rate of about uh, 370, 732 uh, per 100,000. So you can see we have a major problem with transmission. Can we use this technology to try and address that? Um, uh, so this is um, a study which was just coming to completion, looking at the prevalence of airborne organisms in uh, people attending a TB clinic. So here, um, if we're looking at what's driving the prevalence, if we go to the TB clinic population, the TB clinic uh, basically uh, separates individuals coming there into three mutually exclusive groups. The first one is TB disease, lab proven, sputum positive, gene expert positive. Second group is TB disease that's smear negative or sputum negative. And the third one is a group of people they don't think have got TB uh, who are uh, undiagnosed, untreated and uh, discharged from the clinic. This is looking at those three groups and you can see this is looking at symptoms that all three groups were symptomatic. The more symptoms were present in the sputum positive um, than the other two groups. But you can see that during the four visits, which spanned six months, that symptoms resolved uh, totally in, in each of the groups. Now, if we look at the prevalence of organisms in their aerosols, you see again, uh, surprisingly, that at baseline, it's around about 90% for all of them. And then otherwise, we were very surprised that the proportion of uh, individuals decreases at each visit and at the six month visit, still 20% of each of these three groups have organisms. However, very small numbers of organisms. So if you look at the numbers, you can see here the statistical decline in um, aerosol bacteria during the um, six months. But again, in group C, who were the individuals that were not diagnosed in TB, but were followed um, uh, for the same period, statistical decrease in numbers of organisms. So if we look again and um, somewhat arbitrarily divide this group into non-rapid decliners and rapid decliners, based on the, uh, the early data at, um, at two weeks, had they managed to virtually clear their organisms down to less than three organisms. You can see that um, uh, two, in multivariate analysis, two parameters uh, stand out. The first one is HIV, which is much more associated a sixfold higher uh, proportion in the non-rapid decliners. So it's a factor which um, is interfering with uh, treatment or time. And then the other one is previous history of TB, which is associated with an almost ninefold um, uh, um, increase amongst the rapid decliners. So there's obviously a major uh, immunological um, import to this, that uh, poor immunology or impaired Im immunology of HIV affects it one way, but somehow or other previous TB treatment affects it the other, the other way. So um, rounding this up, I find this um, uh, quite surprising. So it raises some questions of what is the nature of TB disease? Uh, we're showing that um, disease was proven in group A, was highly suspected in group B, but group C seem to have a transient infection. So does this mean that TB organisms are necessary but not sufficient to cause TB disease? We have the question of why did group C present with symptoms? Was this a new strain of TB, a first infection with TB? Was there an intercurrent infection or some other immunological perturbation uh, between the balance between the host and the pathogen? Uh, it does raise the question of the role of inflammation. Uh, there's a lot of work now on uh, transcriptomic um, signatures for inflammation preceding a diagnosis of TB. Uh, there's PET-CT studies which have shown um, local inflammatory changes during treatment and after treatment in different parts of the lung. And the data that I showed you from DARPENG, um, many of those um, uh, chemicals and lipids 
uh, are host derived rather than um, uh, pathogen derived. So it raises that question. And then work for us to move forward is we obviously have to show that these uh, aerosol derived organisms can actually transmit infection. Um, then it raises the question of why aren't all areas of the lung uh, infected if, uh, if people are ex exhaling these at all times and re-inhaling them in their dead space. And then um, uh, the other interesting field is now it's sort of moving microbiology into single cell microbiology or porcy bacterial microbiology. And I think that's uh, a very interesting uh, field uh, to develop. At the moment, um, um, uh, whole genome sequencing, et cetera, hasn't got down to, for our purposes, to single cell, but it may well be there in the near future. Uh, so on that, I'd like to uh, thank my uh, team in the Aerosol uh, Research Centre and again acknowledge my uh, collaborators and funders. Thank you for your attention.